Hi everybody, it's Corey again. It's Monday and I want to share with you just a little bit more opening up uh, the topic that we talked about yesterday, which is uh, what makes a church a church. And in the midst of that, we opened up a Bible passage uh, from a speech of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And for me, it kind of starts with the question that's been all the way throughout all of history and works its way all through the Bible, and that is, where do you find God? God, where are you? And I know that's a question a lot of people are asking these days. Where is God? What is God doing? And the answer that a lot of people had come up with throughout history was found in religion. You find God in religion. And religion was often tied to holy people, holy places, holy buildings. And that's even true in the Old Testament where it's talking about the temple. And then, so I want to remind you of Stephen's words where he kind of deconstructs that idea that God can be found in a building. And here's what he says. He says, our ancestor carried the tabernacle with them through the wilderness. It was constructed according to the plan God had shown to Moses. Years later, when Joshua led our ancestors in battle against the nations that drove out of this land, the tabernacle was taken with them to their new territory, and it stayed there until the time of King David. And so that's the idea that God lived in a tabernacle. That was a tent that traveled with God's people through the wilderness. It was a symbol of the presence of God. And a lot of people thought that's where God lived. That's where God was. And then later on in Acts chapter 7, it says, that David found favor with God, and he asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. However, the Most High doesn't live in temples made by human hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Asked the Lord. Could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? And so this is the idea that the Stephen's making this point that uh, the, the leaders throughout all of Israel's time rejected God. Uh, they, they rejected him over and over again. And if you read through Stephen's sermon, you'll see uh, what somebody had once met described the Old Testament as the story of what doesn't work. And you'll see in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, that's basically the point that he's making, and it totally offends the religious leaders. That's why they stone him. But, but the sin, the rejection that Stephen's talking about, if you take a look a little later in verse 51, you'll see it's that they resisted the Holy Spirit. So in other words, when you get enmeshed in religion, you can end up resisting the Holy Spirit. It's a good lesson then. It's a good lesson now. And the main point that I think that Stephen wants to make is this. It's found in verse 49. It's that God doesn't live in holy buildings. In fact, God doesn't even need holy buildings. Isn't that the point of verse 49? Where Stephen says, heaven's my throne, the earth's my footstool. Can you build me something better than that? The answer is, of course, no. And, and, and so what you'll see is Stephen is building upon a tradition that really intensified with the prophets of the Old Testament. It's a critique of people who get really wrapped up in temple religion. In other words, letting a building and all the things happening in it, uh, letting that be your faith, the center of your faith. So much so, the most famous critique is found in Jeremiah chapter 7. And if you don't know Jeremiah chapter 7, you should read that one. That, that is one of the most famous sermons in the Old Testament where God asked Jeremiah to go to the temple steps and basically call out his people uh, about temple religion, that they were trusting in the wrong things and their hearts were far away from God. But here's one of the things that Jeremiah says in that sermon, Jeremiah 7, 4. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. It's not going to work. Jeremiah says, it's just a building. And then Jesus carried on that tradition as well. In fact, it got Jesus in a lot of trouble with the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day because he talked about how the temple would one day be torn down. And that was totally offensive to the religious leaders. It was torn down. Jesus was right. 
but looking ahead, that offended them. Uh, Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple. And so he was basically saying, hey, listen, I know what should happen in this place, and people's hearts are far from me, and I want it shut down. Um, you, you'll see later on in Jesus' life when he died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, he, he, he talked about that the temple was him. In fact, in John chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, turn there. John chapter 2 and verses 19 to 20. We have this scene that happened several times in Jesus' ministry. And this is just after Jesus clears the temple. And here's what he says in verses 19 and 20. After they asked him, okay, what miraculous sign are you going to give us to show us that you're really, truly from God? And then Jesus says in verse 19, all right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And that got them, that just set off like a bomb in their hearts. It offended them. It says, what? It's taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? What they didn't understand is Jesus wasn't talking about the literal, physical building temple. He was talking about himself that he was going to die on the cross and rise again in three days. But embedded in that truth is the truth that Jesus is saying, I am replacing the temple. So Jesus is saying, I'm the temple now. You don't need this big structure to try to see who, what God is like and who he is and hear from God. Just come to me. And maybe that's probably the most offensive thing that Jesus could have said to them. And their hearts rejected him because of it. So the idea, of course, so we see now how it's been traced all the way through the Old Testament and then in Jesus' life and ministry and even now in Stephen after Jesus. And that is the idea that where do you find God? You don't find God in a building and you don't find him in religion that happens in a building. Now, a lot of you be asking, well, well why was there ever a temple? The idea, and we can unpack it a little bit more sometime, is that God made allowances. And quite often in the Old Testament, you'll see quite a few of them, where it really wasn't God's final plan, but God makes allowances. L let me give you a few examples. The law that God gave his people and the sacrifices that happened within that law. That was only temporary. That was just an allowance. Does God really forgive people because they sacrifice animals? Absolutely not. Uh, does God want us uh, to down to every little um, dietary requirement and what clothes we wear? All of that spelled out in the law. Good stuff in the law. Good stuff embedded in the sacrifices. But that wasn't God's real desire. He was accommodating to them. He was allow, making an allowance. Same thing happened with a king. God's people wanted a king like all the other nations around them. Did God want them to have a king? No, he wanted to be their king, but he made allowances for it. He made allowances for a temple and a tabernacle. He made allowances that they could have a land and, and be a nation. These were all good things, and we see all of them in the Old Testament, but these were only uh, shadows. These were only just placeholders until we really found the full presence of God in Jesus. So what's the point? Where do you find God? That's the big question. The big question now, it's always been the big question. And when it comes to the temple, you're the temple now. You'll find that if you take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. You are the temple of God. It's not a building, it's you. And uh, that's that's amazing. That's where God lives. You want to you wanna know where God is? If you've trusted in Jesus, here's where he is. He's in you. But then there's also the idea that, that Jesus and his spirit, the Holy Spirit, are God's presence now. You don't need to go to a building or a holy place to find God. You find God in Jesus and his spirit that's at work in the world and in you. And it also means that worship doesn't need to happen inside of a building. I, I still believe you need to get together with the people of God, but worship can happen anywhere all the time. So I hope that's encouraging to you today. Now you know where you can find God. And so I'm hoping you're going to see him at work all around you and in your heart these days. Now let me pray for you now. 
God, I pray for your people. I pray that they would know uh, your strength in these days. I pray that they would know your presence in these days. And uh, God, I pray you'd always be stripping away the things that we think are really important and helping us to find you and to find joy in a relationship with you, stripped of all of the things aren't, that aren't necessary. Because God, all we want is you. In Jesus' name, amen. See you again later. Bye.